Hi guys, what's up here? It's Will and John, the Mimi Huddle is back for uh, another edition, another breakdown of another card, which it seems to be going on for weeks and weeks and weeks, but after this one we've actually got a break and it's actually going to be nice to just kind of chill for a little bit and not be in the, the kind of downtime looking at fights and so on, um, and we're in... The UFC is kind of going all over the place, and they're back in Brazil for this one here with Jan Blachowicz against Ronaldo Jacare Souza, your main event. And then um, you've got Shogun, you've got Charles Oliveira, so you've got some big Brazilian fighters on this card here. Um, so, yeah, and uh, I'm looking forward to kind of settling in and watching that and um, seeing how it all kind of goes down. Coming off the Russia card this past weekend, and I'm still kind of catching up with some of that. I've seen the main event, I've seen Danny Roberts, which I think I see that feels like he can counter and he can wrestle. He did a little bit of both, but that counter was sick. Mm-hmm. A sick knockout. That, that got me off my seat. And I cannot believe that guy didn't get a bonus out of that either. Disgusting, like, was, it? that's, that's really bad showing. Like, when, that's a vicious knockout. Um, clean, clean shot, but that's what it is. As long as Danny kind of got the win, and uh, I feel really stupid for kind of picking against him, but it's hard to kind of trust in his chin. But very, very happy. Um, before we kind of get into this and before I, I move you over to John and see how things are with him you guys have been awesome the last two weeks with views I think we've averaged over like um, I think it's 10,000 10, views in, in the last mm. two which is incredible for us so we really do appreciate it. we've garnered a lot of new subs we're well on our way to 900 and we're well on our way to 1,000 which we're, we're definitely probably that's going to be a, a thing that we get fairly early on in 2020 which is going to be massive for us for myself and John it's a big number for us together we, we thought it might take a bit of time but it's actually came along the last few months very very quick so uh, just thank you for that if you like what you see hit that like button if you uh, like what you see content wise hit that uh, subscribe button and hit the, the bell and be notified when everything comes on there and uh, yeah just a big thank you from the pair of us John a lot of fights over the weekend we also had Cage Warriors in, uh, in Cork mm-hmm. we made that a reintroduction back into Irish MMA, which is long overdue, and they've actually announced three cards for yes. twenty, which I've kind of got an eye on the Belfast, Belfast. in May. Mm-hmm. Very close across the water. I love Belfast, mm-hmm. um, so that might be something that you never know. I mean, you might kind of end up at that one. Yeah, yeah, possibly. I've kind of I, mean, I saw that as well, bro. I saw yeah, the May card. Yeah. In May, I think it's a good time to to kind of go for fights um, mm-hmm. over there. And so, like I say, I love Belfast and. Um, even since we were last there, I was there. When was I there? Oh, you June. did go over, didn't you? June and July, and it's changed a little bit. Remember the same part we're around? It's kind of yeah. changed a little bit. It looks a lot nicer. Um, and not that it wasn't nice before, but it's like really changed things a little bit. It's really nice built by the water there. But uh, yeah, that's for next year. How was your weekend? How did you enjoy the fights? Um, and uh, up to anything specific? Are you getting ready for your fight? How's training going? Yeah, I, I'm getting ready for my fight. Yeah, just early days of training camp. Uh so speak it's not really training camp just kind of conditioning now at the moment just getting the condition up uh, before we start to get the nuts and bolts which will start probably in December time we'll start to crank it up then uh, so my Christmas dinner is going to be veg and, ch- and veg and turkey but uh, bro yeah good good weekend of fights uh, Volkov won whoop whoop mm-hmm. it's the only fight I cared about uh, and yeah all in all not a bad card uh, gosh Khabib's face whoop against mm-hmm. yeah folks we it was Khabib's cousin, yep, so uh, got a couple of messages on the comments section below on that from last week. Uh, by the way, it was a great conversation. Uh, lots of people joined in the, co- uh, in the comments last week. Again, this week, do join in the conversation below with the predictions, your picks, your bets. We love hearing how well people have done and what people's thoughts are on the fights, but all in all, mate, I've had a, a good weekend. Chiropractor today gave me the all clear. Enough, there's no niggles, no problems, so I'm happy. I can get back to... Hard training again, so I always like to get a little maintenance check, look after everything, make sure I'm tickety boo. So I'm good and can't wait to get this card broken down. And we have a little break so I can catch up on Rick and Morty season four, which has just come out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now we're going to get into this one here. And uh, yeah, I'm going off Wikipedia here. And this mm. one, I don't think it's going to be the first fight in the card. I'd be surprised if it is. Yeah. But if you're in Brazil and you are, don't miss this one. If mm-hmm. you're at home, uh, and you're thinking, oh, I might miss the first few fights on Fight Pass. Don't miss this one. Ariana Lipsky, Veronica Macedo, might just be the fight the UFC's like the big the, the fight in the UFC with the two maybe hottest girls has ever been in a fight. Let's put it that way. Um, because these are two lookers of the sport, very very much so. 
uh, and fighters who are fledgling a little bit uh, and some who are, are, are trying to rise up a little bit. You've got Lepsky, obviously. She had a rough start. And then you have Macedo, who's coming off a win. John, I'm going to throw over you. And, uh, how do you see this one kind of going down and starting off the night? Yeah, uh, interesting matchup. I spent a long time studying their Instagram. Lots of focus went into their Instagram posts uh, to get an idea of how this fight would go down. Um, for any women tuning into this, yes, that is Dora Rodri, but I will <laughs> not lie. They are exceptional, exceptional lucky women, and I've seen Veronica in person because she was on the same fight card as me, and she is obscenely beautiful in person. Uh yeah, I, I've got to be honest. With you, I'm going to kick off, kick off, and say Veronica Machado is probably actually going to be my pick in this. Uh, she's a lot more confident in a, in a last fight, and I, I, for me, Lipsky's just not been the same girl that came into the UFC. The the hype trainer, even you and I have watched her outside of the UFC prior, and we've seen performances she put on. We've seen how well she was and what she could do. I feel like she's not pulling the trigger in the UFC. I don't know if she's changing her style in a way to think that she needs to keep her position in the UFC. She should fight a certain way. I don't know if it's a confidence thing. I'm not, I'm not sure. But like Molly McCann, geez, Louise just lit her up like a Christmas tree. And Lipsky just didn't know what to do. Did not know what to do. Could not get ahead around it. Couldn't get in the fight. Couldn't get the. Couldn't kind of match the rhythm that Molly was coming out with. Couldn't kind of get a flow. Couldn't like get a rhythm with the combinations and strikes, because Molly was just hitting her with the boxing. For me, Veronica's going to obviously throw kicks. She's got the dexterity uh, and she's got the kind of move uh, the movement. But for me, I think she's going to go for takedowns. If I'm Veronica, I'm going to get a takedown in. Get 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 Lipsky on the ground. She does. She ain't good on the ground. And Molly's showing it. Joanne Calder. For me to say Joanne Calderwood and Molly McCann look good in top position is not a thing you'll hear very often. So if they can look good on top, it means the opponent they've got is not good at defending these takedowns. And if I'm Veronica, I've got to take a leaf out of that book and after her last performance. I think she's going to use the kicks, the strikes is going to open up a little bit and the takedowns are going to be there. So I'm confident that Veronica can get the takedowns, get in top position. Lay out some striking, but I think Veronica might even get a submission win here. Um, she, she's quite aggressive with going for the submissions and getting trying to get the finish in the fight. So I'm going to go with like a late stoppage for Veronica here with a submission, mm -hmm. possibly like a rear naked choke or something. Uh, from Lipsky trying to scramble up, even against the cage, Veronica gets the hooks in and can get something sunk in there. So sub via choke for Mar Veronica or north and south choke, giggity. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is obviously Veronica's coming in in pretty super short notice actually, mm -hmm. I think it was last week or so she was announced she was in this fight I think she was fighting in South Korea in kind of back end of December so she's jumping in here really really quick and in short notice but um, Lipsky is just not delivered in the UFC at all I don't know whether it's the the, the calibre of position, she's maybe moved up from what she faced in KSW maybe it's the occasion of fighting in the UFC uh, but she's struggled big time and like you said if if you have people like Joanne Calderwood and Molly McCann taking you down something is showing up there um, because we know she's super aggressive in the feet she she throws a lot but she's she's took a lot of shots in the UFC she's had a lot of strikes against her in two fights and that's a little bit worrying and like I say if you're getting taken down and and um, with, with the calibre that you've faced so far then I think that's the way you beat Ariana Lipsky is mix it up on the feet, it's going to be aggressive. She's going to land shots. Veronica's going to land shots. But if the takedown's there for Veronica, I think she needs to take it. Um, like I said, I've, I'm going to pick Veronica, but I'm a little bit... Um, I've got a funny feeling that Lipsky, I think she knows her back's against the wall in this one here, and, and she, she might kind of show up. It's a hard fight to feel super confident in, in a pick, in my opinion. Like I said, Veronica's coming off. She started off three losses. She got stopped a couple of times. Then she got a super quick armbar finish of Pollyanna Viana where it kind of went to a scramble and she got an armbar and uh, it was a beautiful beautiful submission uh, all in all um, but I'm going to pick Veronica in this one here but I, I feel like Lipsky if you're baiting this fight I would probably lean on the Lipsky side um, but like I say it's maybe just based just passing by this one and just kind of watching and not taking your eyes off the screen and, and just watching yeah just watch um, but I'm going to go uh, Veronica Macedo for the W there. Steen, uh, in the women's side of the fights, we've got uh, Vanessa Mello against Tracy Cortez, who's another actually beautiful-looking girl, if we're being honest with you. Um, 
Yeah, this is a, a fight that's kind of, again, got put together relatively quick. I'm not sure. Did someone fall out of this fight? I think they did. Uh, I'm not sure. Did someone fall out? Mm. Oh, sorry, someone, Tracy came. Didn't Tracy, did Tracy come in short notes, I don't believe? Yeah, I, I'm not sure who it was. I'm sure that somebody's fell out of this fight. There's been a lot of changes in this fight card, actually. Yeah. I remember looking somewhere and there's been like 62% of the card has changed uh, in this one here. But I think Cortez is moving up to bantamweight. And that's a little bit of a... I'm not too sure about that, if I'm, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Um, Melo lost her uh, debut against uh, Arun Aldana, where she really just got beat upon pretty badly in that fight, if I'm being honest with you. But that was in Mexico. I think she actually maybe came in there on short notice for that one. She got completely outstruck, just beat at length. Tracy Cortez is not that type of fighter. She's not going to beat you on the feet. She's more of a grinder. So Melo, I think, has definitely got the, the striking advantage in this one here. Um, but I think Cortez is the, the, the better grinder to her. I think she can get takedowns. She might not be able to hold Melo down for so long, but I think she can continue to get takedowns. Um, like I say, she's a smallish type of girl coming up from 125 uh, to 135. Um but like she's got a great story behind her on the Dana White show. I think her brother passed on. She fights in a memory of her brother. Uh, so that's, in my opinion, it's really, really nice to see. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I've, I'm going to go Tracy Cortez for the simple reason I, I've, I'll speak about this at the end. But I've, I've got on a parlay, so I've, she's in one half of that. So I've got Tracy Cortez. But if this stays standing, I think she's at a disadvantage, but I think she can get takedowns and win the rounds through that. So I've got Cortez via decision. Yeah, it's another one where I'd spend a bit of time on Tracy's Instagram just to get a better understanding of who she is and really get to know Tracy and feel like I connect to her. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I'm going with Tracy Cortez as well. I think that the pace that she can keep is quite high. Uh, Mello throws strikes that aren't clean. She just kind of throws heavy hoping the head's there. Now, Tracy has not got any head movement. She hasn't got the best footwork. She kind of goes into punches a little bit. Uh, I would, if I was her, I'd be going forward with strikes, like a one-two, like one-two-one, two, one, shooting for the takedown grapple and get a fight to the ground. I think Tracy can definitely get the takedowns in there. But the thing here for, for Tracy and, uh, and Mello is it kind of suits the pair of them because they're both the same height. I think they're both five foot five. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, both of them in the last matches were at, certainly at height disadvantages as well as uh, uh, reach. So the pair of them will find it a bit more comfortable when they're facing each other. But I just feel that Mello, not great with the striking. She throws heavy but doesn't land that well. I think Tracy's got a great gas tank in her, and especially because she's not extra cut those, uh, cutting that extra 10 pounds. That probably might be a bit benefit to her. You know, she'll probably feel like she has a bit more spring in a step, so to speak, because she's not depleting herself those extra ten pounds for this fight. I think Tracy will get the takedowns. And what she's very good at, if you if you do watch when she fights, is she good she's good at keeping a weight on. So when she gets you down and if you're trying to get back on your feet, by what I mean by keeping a weight on is when you're getting up, she's very good at positioning herself to keep heavy on top. So you have to wait take her weight on the way up. And as she's as you're doing that, she'll get hooked, she'll hook in a leg, tie up your legs, she'll tie up the hands, she'll delay that inevitable kind of escape potentially, and then you know, you, it's a lot of hard work then to get up. She makes you work for that stand up and if you don't she'll like I say she can wrap that hook in and she can get start attacking that back and she's very good at the back and uh, back control she's very good at holding the con uh, holding people there back control and uh, being aggressive she likes to throw strikes as well as go for the subs yeah I know last opponent wasn't the best with the grappling aspect but I think uh, Mello might have a bit of an issue with Tracy's kind of relentlessness um, I've, of course I do believe that Tracy will come sh come up short so to speak with other opponents there's girls who are out there who will be able to defend the takedowns and strike and box her head off but I'm going to, tra I'm going to take Tracy in this one because I think she's she's definitely got the gas tank and the kind of grappling aspect to get the win here even with a £10 difference so moving on I think uh, I don't know what fight actually this fight um, it's, in, it's in the featherweight division yeah it's the featherweight division mm -hmm. Henning Brow um, moves up again he's been flip-flopping between divisions for the last god knows how long Douglas is Silva and Dragic and Henning Barrow uh, and this honestly I'm, I'm like she's uh, it's like how many chances is Henning Barrow going to get and I mean can he pull it out and can he turn things around it's hard to, I don't know it's hard to it's hard to tell how do you see things going 
Well, Helen looked okay against Luke Sanders, but he didn't look the same guy pre-TJ Dillashaw taking his soul. TJ literally took his soul away after that fight. Because if you, if folks don't remember who Henan Barrow is, Henan Barrow was the f- goddamn king of the band. He was, he, was, he was starching folk. And I mean starching them. People couldn't get near him. They couldn't handle his strikes. They just, he was electric. Man, like how fun was Henan Barrow? And Henan Barrow got a got the opportunity to fight for the belt when he wasn't meant to fight for it. I believe he got like a short note, he got a step in, he stepped in short notes and he took it and he just shone like a star and him and Jose Aldo training together, 45, 35 in the bag and they were just owning those divisions. Like that was a hell of an era. Um, and it's weird, like Hannibal Rao's not even that old but he is, in fight years, he is aged dramatically. Um, Luke Sanders landed a good couple of strikes and just landed, went back to this, went back to the well, landed a few, the few again. Man, I'm not being funny. I've got zero faith in Henan Barrow, zilch, absolutely nada, because you just have to hit Henan Barrow, get him to the second round, and you're cushy. I don't, I don't think Douglas uh, Andrade is going to be the best fighter in the world. He's a very good, solid fighter though. He's got good fundamentals, good solid striking. He doesn't do too many, too much wrong. I think he's an all-round. I think he's a solid, good fighter. I think he beats Henan Barrow. Mate, I do. I think he stops Henan Barrow again. I think Henan Barrow gets his last shot and gets out. And, and Henan Barrow's just probably taking his pay, paycheck. Do you know what I mean? He's just he's staying with the UFC while he can and getting, a pay, getting paid. I think he'll get one more fight. The UFC might feel like they don't want to let him go because you've got to remember, if you let him go, he's probably going to get signed to Bellator. Where with Bellator, they'll match him up with their better fighters, but it's the name brand, so they lose out on selling what Henan Barrow, who Henan Barrow is. So it's the name value the UFC like. Do you got to remember the UFC is a business, not looking after the fighters. They're more looking after themselves. But I've got to go with uh, Douglas here, mate. I think Douglas Silva beats Henan Barrow. Henan Barrow puts his head down, gets cut by the UFC, and probably goes off to like Bellator or Risen, where. He'll go up a weight class possibly and might, I don't know, might do a bit better against me opponents. He might get some more suitable fights, fights there to bring him back up again because they've done it with Frank Mir. They've done it with a few other guys there. So, yeah, I'm going to go with Douglas, mate. I think he can actually stop in a round. Yeah, like I'll, I'll come out show and say this. I, I, for some reason, really wanted to pick Henan in Barrow in this one. Hmm. But... Um, like for some reason, I was going to go back and I was going to watch the TJ Dillashaw. I wasn't going to watch the TJ Dillashaw fights because I mean that's five years ago that that, yeah. that, that, that those fights went down. So that's a long time to kind of look in. But what I think TJ Dillashaw absolutely took his soul in those two fights. Mm-hmm. I think that they absolutely demoralised the man to a point where he he's just a shell of himself, and it's crazy because like I say, if people never seen the Hen and Barai before those TJ Dillashaw fights. Go back and just watch his back catalogue of fights because that guy was a stone cold killer, and he had Dana White calling for for him the baddest man in the UFC, the pound for pound best fighter in the world, uh, and at the time you couldn't really kind of doubt against him honestly because he was just on fire and he was he, he was hurting dudes, he was spinning back kicks, he was catching people in guillotines, you name it. But since since then, I mean, he is an absolute shell himself. Mm-hmm. And what surprised me more over the last few years is actually, like, the guy takes a lot of shots, but yeah. maybe this first knockout in that five-year span or four-year span since he fought, last fought TJ, maybe this is where his durability is really going to go, where if he takes a clean shot, I mean, he took a clean shot against Sanders and got knocked out. But this might be the thing here where it might not even be a big shot that really knocks this guy out. So... Um, I mean, he's he's lost four in the bounce. The the reason he's been kept around and is really a name value thing because he's not off on. I mean, he's not won a fight in three years. He beat Felipe Novera. Yeah. The fuck is Felipe Novera? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. when you're when you're the best in the world and then you beat you only beat. You beat last two, like, look, his last two wins though: Mitch Gagnon, Mitch, yeah. Felipe Nova. I mean, this was a guy that was. Destroying Uriah Faber, destroying Eddie Wineland, destroying Michael Do- uh, McDonald. Well, he was flying through people, um, and he's—I mean—he stopped Gagnon, 
he beat Nova pretty convincingly, but that was at a catch rate because I think he missed weight. He missed weight uh, a couple of times against yeah, Aljamain Sterling. He's, yeah, he's tried to move up to to featherweight where he had Jeremy Stevens, which is not your nicest introduction to, mm-hmm. to kind of that mm-hmm. division when you that guy. Like I said, for some reason, I really wanted to pick Edinburgh in this spot. Um, when you look at Douglas De Silva, Andre Andrade, I think he's um, he got broken badly last fight. And that, that happens against Peter Young, because Peter Young can do that. And we might see that yeah. happen in a couple of weeks against Uriah Faber, where he was taking him down, he was beating him, he was bloodying him up. And I don't think Douglas really wanted any more of the fight when he went back to the, the corner on the second round, which is fair enough. If he knew that he was going to take another five minutes of profound beating and he didn't want to take any more, then by all means, just bring yourself out of the fight. And that's kind of what happened in that one there. Like I say, but it's, as much as I want to pick him around a spot like this, and like... I'll just bring up the odds really quickly because it's crazy that a former UFC champion has odds beside him like this. Uh, Henneborough, plus 200 against Douglas De Silva de Andre. This is a guy that was like massive. I'll try and have a look and see what his betting lines was in those fights back years ago. I mean, he was a massive. <laughs> mm-hmm. The first DJ Dillashaw fight. He, he must be a huge favourite. He closed a minus 12-15 favourite over TJ Dillashaw. Holy smokes! Because yeah. TJ was another one who came in short notice. I don't think TJ... Yeah. TJ stepped in for someone as well in that. Yeah, but he yeah. was minus 800 against uh, Wineland. He was minus nearly minus 400 against Faber. And then, I mean, he was a favourite against Stalin. He was a favourite against Kelleher. He was a favourite against Andre Yule. He was a, actually an underdog against Luke Sanders. He's a plus 200 underdog. That's crazy to me when you look at that. I'm going to pick Douglas De Silva de Andrade, but I'll say this. I've got this feeling that he's going to pull something out one last time. I don't know what it is in me that thinks that, but I can't trust the durability um, of him. Like I say, he can take a few shots, but I think that after that last knockout, mm. maybe clean shots are going to start becoming a lot harder to take. So, uh, and Douglas De Silva, uh, Douglas De Silva, De Andrade is a little, little tank. He'll come forward. He'll throw a lot of shots. He'll be grimy. Um, but if Brown's going to pull this off, I've got a funny feeling he might catch a submission or something. But I'm not going to pick him. It's hard to pick him in this spot. So I'll go with Douglas De Silva, uh, probably via decision in that one there. Well, away division. Warley Alves against Randy Brown. Another very, very kind of close fight here. Yeah. I've always think that I've always thought that Randy Brown's he's been progressing. Of course, he's made some mistakes. He's got caught a few times. That happens against the people. He's like he got caught against Nico Price. He catches people um, with with weird stuff all the time. But he rebounded with a beautiful knockout of Brian Barbarina. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Bam Bam's a hard guy to put away, and he put him away. So um, when you look at Wally Elvis, I've always been impressed with him since he came to the UFC. I was just always his conditioning. Um, him gassing in fights just threw me off a load of times but he's fought the far caliber, the better calibre opposition I think he's the more dangerous fighter when it comes to a finishing ability um, and what I've liked in his last few fights is the fact that he's slowed himself down we've seen that in the, the fight in Poland where he started to slow himself down a little bit started to pick his shots he's got beautiful thudding leg kicks mm-hmm. he can attack the body very well and if he can keep his if he can keep his um, like himself intact, where he, he's he's not blowing the, the gas tank and he's not losing all his energy, then across a 15-minute fight, he's a very very dangerous guy. And you've seen that against Sergio Moraes, where that he stopped him late in that third round, uh, got himself a big finish there in, in Brazil. And then, like I say, Randy Brown, I think, is a guy who who is progressing, but I think he, he's going to be one of these guys that's going to struggle to reel off consecutive wins. I think he's going to show spurts in fight where he looks good and then other other times he'll make mistakes. Now, if he shows them up, um, I, I think he, he can reel off a few wins. I'm going to go with Wally Alves, so I think he's a little bit more dangerous. I think as a submission grappler, he's very dangerous. As a striker, he's a good counter-striker and he has got definite power with some of his strikes, but I don't think Randy Brown's really kind of got that one hit a quit of power which that, that could come back to haunt me saying that, but mm. um, the accumulation of strikes that Wally Alves can throw at any submission skills. I mean, this guy, I think he's the only guy to beat Kobe Covington in the UFC. It says a lot. Submitted him in the first round in the first 90 seconds of the fight. So, yeah, um, I know that's going back like four years, but still, it's a nice name to have in your, your, your resume. 
Um, yeah, I'm going to go Wally Alves. I actually got him via submission in the second round, so I think he subs yes. Randy Brown here. Yeah, Randy Brown. He did look good, though, with the Brian Barberina fight. Because really Brian, Brian Barberina just wanted to brawl. That was the thing. Brian, Brian wanted once you're close, and if you engage into that fight with Brian... Then he's got a far better chance of winning. But Randy was smart. You know, he kept on the outside, just kept using the footwork, jabbed him away. And Brian just couldn't get past that jab. He tried a couple of times with, like, bobbing and weaving and then coming in with the big shots, looping hooks and stuff. But it just never really was consistent enough to... And Brian just just looked like he was out of answers in that fight. And Bobby really fought a, a smart fight and just landed the, the kind of one-twos on him as he was coming in with a short... landing short on him. Uh, and, I, and I think Brian's a, a, an easier t- target than Wally is. If I if I'm if I'm fighting someone, I think Wally Alves, like you said, decision where I fight, it's hard work throwing leg kicks. It's tiring. It's far more tiring than throwing punches. Um, honestly, it, it's not as easy uh, as, as throwing punches. And he threw a lot of leg kicks on Sergio Moraes. Great game plan through some good hard strikes upstairs and mixed the combination. And he, like you said, I was always a warrior of his condition and I always questioned it for a while because I thought he just throws so wild in the first. He just hasn't got anything left in the second and third. But he looked fantastic in that last one. You know, he really has knuckled down that conditioning kind of issue. He's got the output there for three rounds. I think between the two of them, I think he can have a higher output of harder strikes than Randy Brown can. I think Randy will try to keep the footwork movement, try to keep it at range, but I think Wally will start chopping that leg down, like you say. I'm going to go decision for Wally Alves. I think Randy's going to try and keep as well, as far away as he can from the big strikes from Wally, but I think the leg kicks will take a toll, slow Randy down, and the strikes to the body and the head from Wally will just come kind of combine into just a, a kind of dominant win for him. Um, but yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I think Wally Alves should take the win here. He's a, he's a far more experienced uh, fighter in, in in the realms of opponents. Okay. Next up, we've got the, kind of got the old man of the lightweight division. We've got Mazaran Duba, Francisco Trinaldo facing off against King Bobby Green, who I'm sure retired and has came back again. So um, yeah, who have you got? Well, let's never listen to an entertainment. <laughs> they are the most pointless things I've ever heard. Gus, Gus is meant to be coming back, apparently, as well. And you just, Anthony Rumble Johnson, who's now off the steroids, has decided to come back as well. Just mental. Just mental. I, I just... I don't know. So, you know, Anthony Johnson, that was a good one. Like He, he was down at light heavyweight, got to 230. Now he's like 250 pounds and all natural horse meat. But, uh, yeah... Uh, Bobby Green, yeah, he's back. Trinaldo, I'm, I'm, oh, man, it's a, it's an interesting one because Bobby Green just has to keep the fight on the feet and use his hands. He's got quick hands, nice boxing. But for me, Bobby Green just doesn't show up enough. He's so inconsistent, and I still to this day say that Bobby Green could be kicking ass, taking checks, and he could be far better fighter than he is right now. He could have far more wins under his belt. He just does not show up. There's something upstairs that isn't clicking. Those neurons are not working in his brain. And he doesn't show up and put the right performances on. I feel like he leaves us hanging sometimes in fights. Uh, the Eric Coke fight is a good example of that as well. Um, he, he should have lit up Eric Coke. Should have lit him up and put him to sleep. Like he's far better striker and quicker than uh, Eric Coke is. But he just didn't. He t- talks too much in fights sometimes. A bit of smack talk. And it just doesn't work. I'm like, dude, I, I like Bobby Green, but there's a time to talk and there's a time to shut up and fight. He's got a horrible matchup here because Trinaldo's about 600 years old, but that dude still keeps winning. That knee to the body from Evan Dunham is an absolute jackpot of a move, that beautiful strike. So Trinaldo shows that he can still land sh- shots upstairs, but he's not interested. He's just going to want to sh- get close to Bobby Green, get the fight to the ground, and just take it take it there, drown Bobby Green, and that's all I can see, Trinaldo just has a way of just getting guys down there, because he throws so big and heavy, Trinaldo, because he just doesn't care, because he's not, he's not worried about you taking him down, he's worried he's just wanting to get close to you, get your hands up so he can shoot in, uh, I have got I've got, I've got Trinaldo here, because I just don't I can't put the faith in Bobby Green, because of the inconsistencies of performances he's put in over the years and he can have moments of absolute beauty 
And he could do it here this weekend. He could just light up Trinaldo. And then next fight, he's absolutely gopping. I'm going to pick Trinaldo because he's more consistent. He's more reliable. He's a safer fighter to put your pick on. He's got the takedowns. He can throw counter strikes upstairs as well. So I'm going to go with Trinaldo. Probably maybe a submission win because I think he's got a, a better kind of submission game there at Coke. I think he's just a gorilla when he gets on top of you on the ground. Yeah, this is a tough fight for me because I think mm. that um, Bobby Green's going to outstrike Trinaldo. He's too fast, he's too light in his yeah. feet, too much movement. And Trinaldo, he stands there and he just wings bombs, he wings his shots. A very, very kind of devastating striker, I think. I think he's, his striking is, like I say, you just have to be very, very careful with Master Anduba. But like I say, I think Bobby Green will definitely, from the outside, pick apart Trinaldo. He'll definitely be the one pushing Bobby Green back, but Bobby Green will be moving around the cage. and It's whether Trinaldo can really tie him up and land those shots or land something clean. So when I watched the Dracar close fight, I thought that Bobby Green actually fought a really good fight. He outstruck him. He got a takedown. He passed guard. Still lost the fight. Mm. Um, and he, you've seen that a few times. Like He lands a lot of strikes. He really does. He lands, I think it's four, uh, five strikes per, per minute, which is a lot. This guy's got a very, very high output. But uh, he's always in very, very close fights. And there's no doubt about it, the Rashid Magomedov, the Lando Venata fight. Um, even the, the, the Dracar close one was closer as well. Um, it was a close one, aren't they? Yeah, it was. It really was. And Trinaldo, I mean, he's at he's like 41 in the lightweight division, which is still... And he's not getting any easy fights. No. But the consistency is definitely kind of going... I mean, the people he's lost to, Kevin Lee, he... he I mean, Kevin Lee on his day can beat a lot. Rocked Kevin fight. Lee though in the yeah, first he round. Remember, he nearly put Kevin yeah. Lee away. James Vick was always a, a, a stuff, a hard kind of yeah. tough match on him for being so long, mm. being faster. And then Trinaldo fight, I, I think he was unlucky. I thought Trinaldo beat him in that fight. Honestly, I think that he was really unlucky there. Um, so I see this being a very, very close fight. I see Bobby Green out striking him. But I kind of see Trinaldo getting the decision. I think the shots he will land will will go on a more oohs and more ahs and um, and just it'll look better in the judge's eyes. So I think he can potentially get takedowns as well. That's what I think he should look for. I think he should try and corral him against the cage, and if he can, really just try and take him to the mat and establish some takedowns from there and, and try and work in the game. Probably Green's like a little vet. I mean, oh, yeah. he, he's always been a fun guy to watch. Um, like I say, I thought he retired, and then obviously he you know, came back and um, got the opportunity to fight again down in Brazil. But um, yeah, I'm going to go Masaran Druba split decision win there for Trinaldo. Uh, who have we got next? Uh, we have got Ricardo Hamos against Luis Eduardo Garigori. Uh, and if you guys know know me, I, I've always been a, a bit of an admirer of. Cardo Hamos, I think that he's a really good young fighter. Mm-hmm. Um, not yet. How old is the guy? Like twenty-three, 24, mate. Twenty-three, twenty-four. Yeah. That's that's like. I, I mean, he's got a fair amount of UFC experience now. This is going to be mm-hmm. fight number six in the company. Uh, face some really, really good guys early on. I mean, Tanaka's always tough. Kyung Ho Kang, you've heard me talk about him. I'm a big fan of his. Namagomedov, I mean, that was a sick knockout. Like he got caught in that fight there, and that happens. Narang Medov's got a fight coming up, I think, against Hayoni Barcelos in South Korea. Great fight, by the way. And then he he rebounded against Johnny Newson, who I thought Newson actually kind of really elevated his game in his debut. Came in there mm-hmm. short, is but Hamo showed the cleaner striking, mixed in the takedowns, uh, and just that was a good rebound after a big big loss. And then you look at um, Garigori, who I think I picked Bandanai against him, uh, and that was just so bad in my part. It's going to be one of my worst picks of the year. But, but Garigori is awful watching the yeah. tape study. I've got caught it with still that. is awful. Yeah, I've got caught with that two or three times this year when you watch it. I did it with mm. Staropoli against Aldana. I have did it with Garigori when I, he's against Bandanai. Um yeah, and that's something I'm going to learn in 2020 is kind of keep an eye on these guys, especially fighting in the home countries because um, Staropoli was fighting in Argentina and Gary Gori was fighting in Uruguay and 
Uh, so obviously the home thing, maybe they're trying to give the home guys a winning fight and that's usually what kind of happens, it uh, has been happening. But he looked solid against Bandanai, Bandanai's since been caught, but I think his takedown defence lacks, I think he is at a speed disadvantage, I think he is at a, I think he's very basic with, the, with his striking, where I think um, Hamos has got far more techniques, devastating spins, um, and like I say, he can mix up with takedowns, and I just think he's the more complete fighter in this spot right here. I think this is a good opportunity for him to get another win in Brazil. Garigori's tough, though. I'll give him that. He's a tough, tough guy, but I, I like Ricardo Hamos. I think he should be trying to push for finishes, though. I think he needs more finishes because he had an opportunity in that Newsom fight where he could have finished and didn't. I think if he can try and push through, get a finish here, it'll be big for him and, and, and kind of regarner some of his confidence that he lost in the Namagomedov loss. So I'll go Ricardo Ramos. I'll, I'll pick him be a submission. I'll go submission in early round number three in that one there. Nice. Uh, yeah, I've, I've still got not much faith in Luis. I think he's still pretty basic. I don't think his striking was much in his pre-tape fights, pre I've seen even in his debut. There was not much in his skill set. I don't think... I don't think Ramos should have any trouble with a guy like this. I think he'll literally pull him apart like pulled pork, mate. I think he's beautiful strike. I, I'm I'm big on Ramos as well. I thought he, since he's made his debut, he's he's a crisp striker. Probably my admires his work a bit. That's probably why the lesser of the finishes because he likes to be a a bit like an artist almost. He just likes to paint like a, a domination over fights but I, I'm with you Will I think once or twice he could do with just throwing a couple of heavy ha ha shots in there and then trying to follow up a bit but if he's winning he's winning and he's doing well I, I like his style I like the way he fights I like his footwork I like his movement I just think he's an all round higher level fighter than Luis and Luis should ha be he'll probably swing not throw not hit punch thin air and I think Hamas is just going to be picking off Picking him off easy for straight Lewis, where he's going to come in, get hit heavy, and you can say, well, he can get Hamos get the takedowns if he wants to, and get on top and start really laying out ground and pound there. Uh, but I think Hamos should get a finish in this one. It's the kind of tailor fight for him to get a good finish, then he can start to get, go up the ranks. But I still think there's a lot of progression in this kid. 23 years old, so much time to develop, and it's almost like they've done it the right way with this guy. They put him right under the radar, and he's just had a few, like six fights in the UFC. And he's coming along nicely. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do in 2020 and 2021 as well. How much like next when he starts to really kind of start to fill out his game around when he's 25, maybe 26, you'll start to see hopefully the best out of him. You'll start to see the, the kind of full potential out of him the year around then. Mm. So I think we're off the prelims now. Oh no, we've got one more headline of the prelims here. Uh, Sergio Moraes faces off against James Krause. Um Good in, fight, actually. Yeah. I'm looking forward to watching this one. I've always been a fan of my rice, even though he frustrates me immensely. Mm. Um, but how do you see? Entertaining. He is. Yeah. He is. He's, even, he, he's always in a good fight. Like even if he loses or wins. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like Sergio Marais. I, I think that he brings a lot to the table in the sense of his grappling aspect. You know, he's an obscenely good grappler. His striking over the years has developed, but I do think he's on a decline. I do think he's starting to, to, to kind of uh, become on a decline in, in the fight game. I think that his striking really needed to come on a lot quicker than it has done over the years, I think, for him to stay relevant in, this, in the game. Um, and, and the Wally Alves fight was a great example. You know, there's, a, there's an opportunity there with leg kicks. And uh, James Krause is a wonderful kind of striker. He's, he's a bit... He's got obscure kind of footwork, catching guys out, throws the kind of weird com kind of combinations where they're not expecting it, where... He'll, instead of throwing a standard 1-2 in an orthodox stance, he'll throw a, a jab, step in with the right foot as he throws the right straight to switch to southpaw, then throw, for example, like a left body kick. So then he gets the power, really, in that, back, that left body kick. So he, he kind of throws obscure kind of combinations that is what's really happening in the modern day of MMA. It's really kind of what guys are starting to elevate to. He does a lot of the pad work, James Krause at Glory MMA as well, the gym that he's got there. A lot of the fighters like... Um, Megan Anderson, of course, but you've got Grant Dawson, who's a, a super exciting talent for the future. Um, and James Krause does a lot there. And I think especially recently, um, in the past, I think it was two weeks ago, William Joplin, who was a team member, really big team member of Gloria May, passed away uh, due to the bastard cancer. 
I think it was. I think it's test. I'm not sure if it's prostate or testicular. I can't remember. Sorry, but I I actually interviewed William Joplin a few years back as well uh, in the fight game. Lovely gentleman, lovely human being, and he passed away. and And I think there's going to be a fire in James's belly in this one. I think he's going to have the fire in him for kind of wanting to get a, come away with a win for William. You know that it was he was just a, a kind of really big part of the club, uh, part of the gym part of James Krause's career as well. It was, it was in there a lot. They were involved in a lot of fights together, training and uh, learning together. So I think that plays a factor. Emotion can obviously get the better of fights, but I think James is a very intelligent guy. I think he'll be able to pick apart. I think he'll be able to stop takedowns uh, with, from Marais. I don't think Marais will even get the takedown in. I think James will be able to use the footwork to keep Marais away. I'm going... Uh, James Krause here, I think uh, he can he could probably just pick apart Marais for three rounds if he doesn't finish him. I think it's... Yeah, I'm going to go... Yeah, I'll go with uh, a decision win because I think Marais is really tough. Uh, that Wally Alves fight showed it when his leg was like mince meat. That was horrendous how he stood on that leg still. So I'm going James Krause for decision win. Mm. Uh, this is like... James Krause is actually... He's on a five-fight win streak. So... I mean, it's over five years and he's kind of stepped away and he's been injured yeah. and he's had some things kind of going on. Um, but the guy's got himself a good win streak and he's got to be full of confidence with with that. And I mean, it's got nearly five years unbeaten. If he, if he wins this fight, he's going to be five years unbeaten. And that's, if you can always do that, you're going to give yourself uh, plenty of kind of job opportunities and plenty of fights in the UFC, especially if you're ruling off that. And now you'll take away some of those wins like Crookshank and Shane Campbell. They're not in the UFC anymore, but still, when you, you look at his last two, um, you look at um, I think Wally Alves. He knocked he knocked out, and Alex mm-hmm. White, both tough guys, yep. both dangerous in their own right, and he handled them accordingly. In my opinion, James Crown is a really underrated fighter. He always mm-hmm. has been. Very good coach. Um, he's probably one of those guys that you can learn a lot from being around and listening to him coach his fighters Um, and yeah I I think he's a really really good underrated fighter I've like I say Marais he frustrates me so much because when he's on and he he looks like he's he's good to go um, he is devastating he's a hard guy to face but the guy doesn't push enough for his chosen specialist part of his game and I think he's fell in love with his striking but he just doesn't get the fight to the mat enough where he is super dangerous and super aggressive and and can stifle you down now you've seen that with Ben Saunders now Ben Saunders will give you opportunities because well well, Marais gave him no opportunities in that fight he he went through him that easily that he showed he was showing Ben Saunders how he was doing it and how for for Saunders to get out from underneath him. Um, in the, the Tony Martin fight, he, he got outstruck badly. He was always a step behind in the striking. Got his takedowns, couldn't do anything with them. Um, Wally Alves, completely at a disadvantage striking-wise, got beat up that much that he got knocked out in the third. Now, that's a little bit kind of red flags there for me, but I still think he's super dangerous and... I think this is a big, big spot where, I mean, he's 37 years old, two losses in a row, fighting in Sao Paulo, which is a place I don't think he's ever lost a fight. He's, I think he's like 7 or 8-0 and in Sao Paulo, so maybe maybe this is his spot where he, he kind of likes to have his fights, but... Um, it's hard to pick him in here, but I'm gonna take I'm gonna take one more shot on Sergio Moraes. I'm gonna take him um, one more time. Yeah, one more time. I think I, I pick him in a load of fights. I know I pick him in the Alves fight. I think I picked him in the Rocco Martin fight, and it's bit me in the backside. But I still believe that he's a very dangerous fighter. He could completely get outstruck here by James Krause. Mm, yeah. Um, but I really think he should be pushing for takedowns because I think James Krause you can get him down. Uh, Shane Campbell was a kickboxer. He got him down. We had Alex White, who's not really known as a takedown guy, get him down. Um, yeah, I, I I think that if he can make it close, and especially be competitive in the striking, because that's what's not happened in the last two fights. He's got thoroughly outstruck, yeah. and he's already behind the eight ball going into those second and third rounds. So he needs to come out quick, establish his striking game, try and get this fight to the mat if he can. I think he can win large parts of that fight down there. But Krause, like I say, he's crafty. He could 
very much find a way to get back to his feet. He's good on the ground as well, Kraus himself. Yeah, is yes, right? very, like I say, super underrated. Very underrated, the yeah, he's super, super underrated. underrated. He always has been. I don't know, I don't understand why. Um, but I'm going to take one more shot mm. on Sergio Moraes. I've got a bad feeling, I'm even saying this now, and I'm thinking this is a bad <laughs> pitch. A bad pick, I can feel it already. But I'm, I'm going to take a shot on him. Uh, in this one here, I pull out a win, and it might be the kind of last one in the UFC. But I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take him here, and we'll see how it goes. Like I said, I kind of got this bad feeling. I just made a bad pick. But that's what it is. Uh, Marcus Perez mm. against Wellington Turman's up next. Yep. This, I think, this is going to be an exciting fight. I think this is oh, Perez yeah. is always awkward, and, and in kind of weird fights, I think. But he's super dangerous in a lot of aspects uh, of MMA. So you have to kind of keep your eye on him. Um, because he'll, he'll throw a lot of weird techniques. I think he's very kind of evasive in a, a lot of striking aspects. But on the ground, he's, he's super. I don't want to say he's technical, but he's he's very good. He's very heavy, and I don't think he's going to really have that advantage here against Tarman. Um So I think that he's going to lean more on his striking, which is something that I think he he definitely has an advantage over Will and Tarman. I was actually really impressed with with uh, Wellington in his UFC debut. I thought he fought Carl Roberson very, very well, but he just, I'll be honest with you, I thought once he got him to the ground once, maybe twice, that he would that he would stop Carl Roberson, but he didn't, and then he got outstruck pretty badly. I don't think Perez is of the, the striking acumen of what Carl Roberson is, mm. who um, is a really good, good striker himself. But, um, yeah, I think Tommen can be very uh, competitive on the feet. But I think if he was to get to the ground, I think that he could potentially um, stop Perez really getting off some of the some of his attacks, which can make him so kind of devastating at times. Um, yeah, I don't know here. I'm struggling with this pick, I'll be honest with you. I, I feel like I should be picking Perez, but Tommen's jumping out at me, so... Um, I'm going to go Marcus Perez but I think it's going to be super super close but I do think Wellington's a very very live fighter in this one here so uh, yeah I'll go I'll go Perez and that one be a close decision I was super impressed with Wellington's debut as well mate yeah. really caught me off guard how well he performed and I think that's what the UFC had done I thought they were impressed and that's why they gave Marcus Perez because Perez is a pain in the ass to fight Mm-hmm. I don't like the idea of having to fight him. I think he's just a awkward, just a wild, unorthodox, unpredictable pain in the ass fighter. He is good, don't get me wrong, but his aspects where he is poor. Um, but one thing he's got, he's got a good gas tank on him. That dude will go three rounds. Wellington went three rounds as well. Don't get me wrong. I thought he did really well in this fight. I thought he did good to go three rounds. Perez just got horrible, horrible kind of grind on you. You know, he's got a horrible pace. He can grapple you uh, on the cage, which is one of the things I think he'll do here. I think he'll do a lot of the striking on the feet, get the cage get the cage fighting in, you know, get up against there, clinch work, work on Wellington, grind him up against there, keep it tight, short knees, kind of short punches and elbows, and um, break off, engage in some strikes, break up again, and just kind of rinse and repeat that kind of style of fight. Uh, to, Basically, to kind of stop Wellington and want to get the fight to the ground. Wellington on top, I think, will have a better opportunity on fields on top. But I think Marcus Perez could actually get Wellington down and on top of Wellington and really lay some heavy good ground and pound on him. Because um, Perez has got really good ground control if he wants to get there. Good heavy ground control and can throw some strikes there. Um, Wellington's got a dangerous submission game that he can throw at him um, for the takedown. So I think Perez is going to have to be really, really switched on with him. Uh, the kid's got... I think he's got good potential. I just think it's a horrible way to come in. Carl Robertson, then bloody Perez. I think that's a bloody hard two fights to step in the UFC with. I don't care what the kid's record is. Break him in gently, you know what I mean? Find the guys in the middleweight division who you could maybe think we wouldn't mind going and get, getting rid of that guy's on a two loss streak. He can have Wellington. But <clears throat> uh, I think I think Wellington will get a more super fight after this fight. But I'm going to go with Perez as well. Um, I think Wellington, the way he's going to win is whether like a catching Perez off with a kind of submission like a, a guillotine from a, a takedown attempt or something like that but um, I'm going to go with Perez I just think he's a more well more experienced obviously in the UFC 
he's just got a relentless pace, and I think that will catch out Wellington a lot in this fight. So I think the three rounds are going to be horrible for Wellington because Perez just doesn't leave you alone. Um, so yeah, with decision pe uh, Perez, I think you can just get that win away. Next up, we've got a couple of newcomers to the UFC. We've got Antonio Arroyo against Andre Munez. Who have you got? We're putting on the main card. Um, I think it's going to be fireworks. I think I've got a fun, fun feeling about this fight. I really do. I think it's going to be a, an action-packed one. I think. Arreo does like to throw kicks. Boy, mm. that dude likes to throw kicks, and he's yeah. good at throwing them. That dude can whip in some head kicks. The problem he's got to remember is it's hard to throw head kicks all the time for three rounds. He gassed hard in his in his uh, Dana White contender. He had a two Dana White contender fight. Sorry, I think it was the first one he gassed hard in. I think it was. Mm. Um. Both of them have had two Dana White contender fights, which was weird. The pair of them were on the Brazil one, then they went up to the uh, US one. And the, it's a contrast to styles. Areo likes his strikes and Minos likes his grappling. Uh, or is it Muniz? Muniz? Muniz, yeah. Muniz. Muniz are killing me. Um, I think Muniz uh, can do a lot with his grappling. He's very, very uh, kind of opportunistic as well. He's got He's got a long reach on him. If I, if I recall, he's got a long, a long arm reach, so it's something that you've got, got to take into account. A good example is Tony Ferguson uh, used that reach advantage, not for striking per se, but for the grappling with the weapon that Doss is in and, uh, and the Anaconda chokes. He's got that advantage, and I think that's something um, Minis can do. Uh, one thing I do worry about, though, he is open to getting hit, Minis, and he got starched in a fight against some Russian dude. I want to say starch. He got literally within a minute. The, he threw a punch. The guy just came with it like a, I think it was like a right straight or something and just clipped him and deaded him. So uh, they kind of put me up, put my blinkers up a little bit and kind of thought Rayo has got the head kicks. He could easily land a heavy head kick. How would Minis handle it? I think if Maniz gets the fight to the ground, he's got a submission. So I, I'm going to flip him. This is a flip and fight. I don't mm -hmm. think, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a gimme fight for either one because I think neither of them are of the. I don't think they're great fighters at the present time. I think that both of them have got a lot of uh, holes in their own games. Um, I, I'll go with Arreu because I think he's a, quite an exciting guy to watch in, in the sense of he'll stand and swing. I, I go for like a head kick finish first round. Why not? Let's go for it. He's going to go big. He's going to be in Brazil on a main card of the UFC event. He's got to go style. He's. I think that guy's going to go for broke. He's going to go first round or bust. Uh, so I'm going to go Rayo first round head kick. Why not? Mm. This is why I think it's been put in there. I think it's going to be like I said. I think it's going to be fun. Yeah. I think they've realised the opportunity of being in the main card and uh, yeah, like I say, the way you can look at the, both these guys, a royal kicks like a mule, mm -hmm. and you've got the uh, Muniz who. On the ground, looks he, he has got Legit. super jujitsu. He really does. He's got really good ground control, um, and that, that's kind of where I see the fight kind of being. It if it stays more on the feet, you've got to favour, I think, a royal with his combinations and what, like I say, with his kicks. But when if Minis can somehow get this fight to the ground, then I think that he can. Ha he has a big advantage down there with his jujitsu. But when you look at all of Minis's losses, I mean, he lost to. Uh, what's the guy's name again? Because um, this the guy that he lost to actually got signed to the UFC. Um, uh, Azamat uh, Marzakanov, yeah, but he actually got re just released by the UFC because I think he popped for something. So really, no way. Yeah, he did. He's seven and zero. They signed him. I think he was supposed to fight in the Russian card last week. I mm. think they had an opponent, but um, I'm sure that he popped for something and, and he's fighting it brave. Uh, and I think that open weight tournament that they're having, so um, open weight, yeah, 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 full, yeah. full of open, full of uh, open Mexican supplements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, like I say, it's it's a hard fight to to kind of choose between because you've got obviously a dangerous striker against a dangerous jets guy, but I think that um, Mimi can can stay competitive on the feet. I definitely mm -hmm. think it's an advantage. I've got a feeling he's going to catch one of these kicks, and once he gets it to the ground, I think that's where his strong suit is really going to show in his experience because he has got a lot more experience um, fight experience I should say against just more fights, 18-4 yeah. and four, facing a guy I think he's uh, was it 9-1 and one, I think it is so yeah I think he's going to catch a kick I think he's going to take him to the ground he's going to submit him so I've got uh, Muniz to win that one there uh, moving on to kind of your main big fight part of this card here we've got a fighter here who 
I'm looking at it and thinking, why are you facing Jared Gordon? We've got Charles de Bronx Oliveira against the aforementioned uh, Jared Gordon. I think that Charles Oliveira's come out and he said, look, nobody really wants to fight me, especially down in Brazil. Mm. Jared Gordon was the only guy that really wanted to fight me down in here. And fair play to Jared Gordon for jumping down there because he's taken on a Charles Oliveira that has looked a different gravy in the last couple of years. He is... At 155. Yeah, he's, he's always been dangerous. Um... But his striking's coming to he's came together and he's like yes. a bit more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like before, he, I think he's always had fairly decent striking, but I think the confidence is there that we're, there now where he mm. knows he can actually hurt people yes. with his striking. Where I don't think he ever had that before because he's always had a longish reach, like I say, decent kind of striking game. But I don't think he ever believed in it. I think he believes in it now. I think when you see that David Tamer fight, he outstruck David Tamer, who. I'm sure the people before that would say, look, he's got the advantage over Oliveira on the feet, the speed advantage and everything else. But he beat up David Tamer really badly in that fight. Um, and then he absolutely, like, I mean, he's running through guys. He is mm. running through guys. Um, four of his last fights, he's won performance bonuses. Uh, the guy is a finisher. And you've got someone here, and Jared Gordon, who uh, is super game. He's not going to sit back. He's got, he's going to bring the fight to Charles Oliveira. Um I think that he's better than what the betting line. When you when, I, when we talk about bets at the end of this year, this line's a little bit of whack for me because I think you got someone in Gordon who's a little bit more dangerous, uh, not dangerous, but will bring the fight and could maybe land a shot. And I mean, Charles Oliveira, he's always had those fights where you're not sure. Sometimes he can pull stunts, is what we like to say in the kind of business of kind of watching fights. He can do that. But he's doing it against Max Holloway and he's doing it in other parts against good food fighters. He should run through Jared Gordon here down in Sao Paulo. He wanted to fight. I think he got offered a fight against a better opponent. But the opponent went to fight in Singapore a few weeks ago. But he wanted to fight in Sao Paulo in Brazil, which is fair enough. But um, when... Yeah, I just I just think Charles Oliveira is just too good in this sport at this time. I think that Jared Gordon could give him a fight. But... Um, yeah, I've got Charles Oliveira to probably lynch up a submission and add to his many, many submissions he's had in the UFC. But uh, yeah, I want to see this guy take a big jump up in, in caliber opponent because I think he deserves it, honestly. So uh, I've got Charles Oliveira submission. I'll go into round one. Man, Charles should be fine. A top 15, Dan, yeah, going he, right now. Absolutely like, should. Yeah. Easily top 15. Like, this should be beyond me why the UFC have not bothered doing it. I don't, I don't understand. All you're doing is giving Charles, in my opinion, I think Charles is going to run through Jared. I think Jared's a good fighter. I do think he's a well-rounded fighter, but I just don't think he's at the level of Charles. I think the the issue you've got for Jared is he's got to close distance down. When you when you close distance down, Charles just grabs you and takes you down the ground. So you either fight him at length, where you get picked apart, because Jared will get absolutely picked apart by Charles Oliveira now, because the way Oliveira can use those kicks and jabs, I think he'll absolutely pick him apart from distance. As soon as he comes to close in the gap, Charles Oliveira grabs you, either pulls guard if he wants to, and no thank you being in his guard. Now, don't get me wrong, Jared, Al Jared has trained with Paul Felder, so they've got a bit of a knowledge base, a bit of an understanding of how he is, but Jared's not Paul Felder. You know, that's the thing. Uh, so I think for me, I think it's going to be a pretty straightforward win for Charles Oliveira, TKO or submission. But man, they need to give him a top fifteen dude yeah. ASAP. Like I'd like to see the rematch event. Like I don't know if Pettis coming down back down at one fifty five, but the rematch with them two at one fifty five would be pretty sick. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether Pettis would want that fight now. I think Oliveira's on a different. Mm. He's just he's, he's like, a wave. He's riding a wave. Here. Yeah. When I watch him. Like when he went to UFC years ago, when was it actually? How long has the kid been here? Years, here? years ago, because he's got like, he's got, hasn't he got the most submission wins in the UFC? Yeah, 2010. So he's next year he's going to be 10 years with the UFC. Cool. And like, I mean, he came in blasting guys with submission. He was like, mm. kind of, you could see he was the, that new wave fighter, mm. kind of come in there. And then, I mean, you look at his losses: Jim Miller, Donald Cerrone, Cub Swanson, Frank Edgar, Max Holloway, Anthony Pettis, Ricardo Lamas, Paul Felder. Top top guys, only yeah, the top guys. guys. They're not they're not bad guys at all. All they're top all, level. They're all ranked guys as They've well. All being the top five, I think. Yeah, haven't they? So, 
that's a that's a crazy start. But since that Felder fight, where he was winning large parts of that fight, where or was he actually? No, I think Paul Felder. And that's what it is. Paul Felder really fought Stayed him. in his guard, in which his was guard. crazy. So, yeah. But I'm since sweating then, watching that. he is flew past everybody. Mm-hmm. And he looks like he's just on a different level. He's focused on getting that built. Um, and he could get it. Yeah, but he deserves a top 15 guy. Yeah. Absolutely. There's guys out there that wouldn't want to fight Charles Oliveira because he's dangerous in every facet. But... That's the guy I'm honestly looking forward to seeing this weekend is Charles Oliveira. Yeah. Because he's fun. You know you're going to get a finish or he's going to get finished or something crazy is going to happen. Looking forward to watching that guy fight this weekend. Cool main event. Uh, the legend that is mm. uh, Shogun, Mauricio Hua. Is he, and you should like really admire this guy because we might not be seeing him kick around all too much longer and one of the, like just one of the greats of the sport. Mm-hmm. He faces off against Paul Craig. Who comes here on short notice? Um, who was Shogun supposed to be? Sam Alvey. Sam Alvey, mate, yeah. Um, which I think was an easier fight for who. I think it's a little bit more of a tougher fight facing Paul Craig here because Paul Craig's just crafty and he finds a way to get the fight to where he needs to get the fight to. So, mm. um, cool main event, big spot for Paul Craig, massive mm. spot actually. Uh, who have you got? It is a massive spot, yeah. uh, Paul Craig, but I think a lot of people are looking past Shogun's kind of credentials on the ground yeah. Yeah. big time like people forget Shogun is a black belt ladies and gentlemen a black belt in jiu jitsu tell me how many times you've seen Shogun Hua get submitted in an MMA bout has he ever been submitted in an MMA bout uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head it's free submissions there you go so who's that to then let's have a quick look here uh, lost to oh, Chael Sonnen oh yeah, Chelsea. Got, that was a quick one, wasn't it? I believe. Yeah. Uh, then you've got Forrest Griffin, and then you've got Hanato Sabro- oh, Sabrola. Sabrola. Okay. Yeah. So, in his whole career, three submission losses, not too bad, and he is on the ground a monster. Like if you go back a few years and watch his ground and pound days, he's got ground and pound. He's got good submission defense. He's good with the ground. He's good. But the thing is, he's not actually that easy to get to the ground. He's actually... He's actually... Surpri- people... Uh, a lot of people are writing off Shogun, but I think, what is he? One in, he's lost one in his last five. Mm-hmm. I think he's like four yeah. and one. Yeah. Like I won't lie. I put my hand up. I thought Shogun was done. And the dude is still putting those wins in. Like, a, a, like four and one is a good thing to do in the last four years like it's record like if you thought it was four like five times the last four years something but he's still winning he's had a break since his last fight so that's huge for his chin huge for his body to recover at his age you know 37 i'm not saying it's old age especially the light heavyweight division it's actually not a bad age you know especially middleweight light heavyweight you can get away being 37 it's it's not 35 to 40 you can you still work you're still good on top striking wise shogun Oh my word, he is a monster on striking game. Paul Craig striking. Still not there. No. It's still not developed. And I'm, I, I'm not sure why. Uh, I know Paul's, Paul's probably tentative with getting hit on the chin because yeah. it's, it's been shown that when he gets hit, he, he does seem to not take it too well. Um, Paul obviously wants to get the fight to the ground. I think he'll have a bit of a tough time getting Shogun to the ground. Shogun stays at 2.05. He's... He's strong at 205 still. He hits hard at 205. Paul Craig's got to get to the ground. Then he's got to get the submission on the ground. It's not an easy task. Short notice as well. Um, I'm going to go with Shogun. Because I think a lot of people kind of... I think a lot of people actually kind of thought Craig was, Paul Craig's going to win. If I'm honest with you. A lot, when I went online on social media, kind of people went, eh, I think people are going to be surprised by Paul Craig. And I thought... Mm-hmm. Why, why are you forgetting who Shogun is? He's only 37. He's 4-1 and one in his last fights. Striking hasn't went any... I have noticed his striking deplete. I thought he still hits hard. Those leg kicks are still horrendously scary. Um, and his ground, his grappling aspect, he still is a high-level grappler. He's a high-level jiu-jitsu practitioner. Um, he just doesn't need to use it. Or the problem was he just doesn't tend to use it because he, he likes to stand on the feet. Uh, he's got good takedown defense. I've got to go with Shogun. I have to. I just have to go with Shogun because it's a legend of the game, and he's 
he's smart, he's been in the game a while, he knows the sport inside out. Um, Crazy on trying to get the fight to the ground, but I think Shogun can use the kicks, the leg kicks and the, the kind of straights to kind of really engage Paul in the striking. And I think Shogun can stop takedowns as well. Mm. Paul will probably pull guard, but I think even Shogun, Shogun can handle the guard game as well. Yeah, I, I find it hard going against Shogun in this spot, honestly. Um, when you look at it, Paul Craig, I think, is going to come out and he's just going to look for takedowns. And he's did that in a lot of fights where he's just mm. like literally just went for takedowns or he's clinched up, flopped his back. Um, and if he's if he offensively gets Shogun to the ground and establishes an offensive kind of game, then he could definitely submit someone like Shogun. I think I still think I don't think it's out of the realms of possibility mm. where he catches Shogun and and submits him. I really don't. I think that if he can find the right spot because he seems to do that. And he, he can do that. He can bring it out. He can take a lot of punishment um, and then find something as well. But on the feet, Shogun's going to absolutely light him up like a Christmas tree. He's going he's gonna to beat him up. But I think he could be one of those things where Paul Craig could literally just jump in for takedowns, catch him, and like he could get caught with the elbows. But if he keeps on doing that, not only will he gas out Paul Craig he could gas out someone like Shogun Shogun's not old, like a young guy anymore he's an old dude who's been in the sport for coming on close to 20 years um, and yeah it, it, I, I just think that's a good matchup for Shogun the guy coming in short notice uh, he is tricky because if he can find the right spots he, he can make you pay and he's very opportunistic and a lot of his, a lot of his wins pretty much uh, yeah, but I'm not picking against Shogun here. I think he can knock him out. I think he could easily find the chin of Paul Craig and knock him out. So I'm going to turn back the clocks and see a first round knockout for, for Shogun Hua in that one there. So uh, looking forward to seeing Shogun actually because it's always great watching a Shogun fight. Main event uh, Jan Blahovic against Jacare Souza, who's making his way up to 205. Now that has not been a Bad. It's not been a good spot, I should say. Mm-hmm. Jack's doing that recently. Former champions, uh, big names of the sport, have decided to move up to, to 205. and um, They've been welcomed by big, big dudes who are a lot stronger. Hit harder. <laughs> and Blachowicz has been one of those guys where he knocked mm-hmm. hold up senseless. Mm-hmm. Um, and Blachowicz is... I mean, he's been good for the last couple of years. I always thought... He was always a good fighter, but I didn't think he was ever super, super dangerous. But I think he, he's through. I think he, he's been just a little bit more dangerous recently within the last couple of years, probably since um, probably since the second Manawa fight. I thought that was a great fight where he dropped Manawa a couple of times. He kind of threw more things to the wind where he, he tried to to hurt you more. Caught Krylov with a great submission. Was trying to trade with Thiago Santos a little bit, and then ultimately ended up getting caught. He was winning that fight. Yeah. He's doing good. Yeah, and then the Rockhold fight, he completely blasted. Like Rockhold tried to clinch mm-hmm. up with him, realised, oh, I can't take this guy down. And then when you're in striking fights with, with, with Rockhold, it doesn't take much to knock him out. And we've seen Weidman move up against Reyes. Reyes just absolutely ran through him. And you've kind of got someone like Jackery who's really from that kind of era, um, coming up with Rockhold, coming up with Weidman, yeah. uh, older than both of those Sh- guys. Strike four stays as well. Yeah. And yeah. like I say, I think he's a little bit more. Du- it's hard to say. I shouldn't really say that. I was going to say he's more durable than those guys. It's maybe not the case, but I think he got rocked in a while uh, in the fight, didn't he? Yeah, he was having a, a pretty close fight with Chris Weidman, and ultimately he kind of pushed through and won in that third round. Faced Jack, Jack Manson, who really I thought completely lifted his game for that fight, mm-hmm. and he knew that was a big, big step up. It was his opportunity to face one of the elite of the sport for for many many years, and he he did amazing in that fight. And Jackery did look a little slow. He, he looked a little slow. He looked a little plodding. He looked a little lost with his kind of game plan because he couldn't get the fight to the ground. And Hamanson was um, stuffing him. Um, and now he's moving up to two five. Where I mean, Blahovic is no small man at all. Strong as an ox. Mm-hmm. He's going to be hard. It's going to be really, really hard to get this guy down. Um, I mean, they're pretty similar height-wise. I don't know what Jackery's done to maybe beef himself up to going to 205. 
Um, I think that striking wise, I think he could hurt Blahovic. I, I, I always thought he's a pretty dangerous striker who, if he can get his shots off enough, can be pretty deadly with it. But I don't think he can kind of take too many shots up at this light heavyweight division. I still think he's in that realm of um, these guys coming up. I mean, it's a big jump. 20 pounds is a big jump where you yeah. get someone like. I don't know. I don't know what Jackery walks around. I'm guessing two fifteen, two twenty. Uh, max. Blachowicz. Probably max. Like even even if that. Yeah, Blahovic is maybe what two thirty, thirty five, two forty maybe. I reckon two thirty or so. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's just a bigger and it's a harder fight moving up against mm. these guys. I think out of the three fights that they've had, I think Jackery is more equipped. To, I, I I just got this feeling that I think he's a little bit better, more better equipped than what Weidman and what Rockhold were, eh, because I think that he's still very competitive in his fights. We've seen over the last few years that Weidman and, and, and Rockhold haven't been as competitive in fights. And there's always the, the, the kind of ace in the card there, which is his ground game. If he can find a way to get this fight to the ground, he is going to have advantage over pretty much anybody in the sport, and he's one of the more dangerous, dangerous guys, but it's getting him there... How is he going to get him there? Because he's not going to openly go for takedowns in the middle of the cage. He's probably going to put him against the cage, work there, um, and try and maybe get trips or single legs to maybe get takedowns. But Blavich, it's not easy to get down, and he's a big, big dude, and can he keep him there? That's the thing I am a little bit worried about with that one there, because who was the last guy? Tago Santos took him down, but that was I think that was a brief one, if anything... It's, I think it's going to be hard for Souza to do it. Santos was a big boy, even for 185. Yeah. Santos had a tough time cutting to that weight class. And Santos is big at one, one 205. At 205, I think Santos is that's his proper weight class. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've got... Five I, rounds as weird, well, remember? Yeah, it's a weird fight for me. Like, Jackery's going to be refreshed being at 205. Mm. Absolutely, and he's not going to have that killer weight cut. I mean, that, that was a big weight cut for him making 185, and he did it like the pro that he is. Mm. Um, and it, like Blahovic is dangerous, but he's not like he's like him getting finishes is not like a, an occurrence for Jan Blahovic because he doesn't really do it all that often. Did it with Devin Clark, did it with Krylov. Obviously, I'm saying that he's like he's three of his last um, six fights. He's he's kind of got 50 percent ratio, and that's kind of where I put my part um, for getting finishes. Um, like I said, for me, I think Jackery has to get him against the fence, and that's where he can work his takedowns. But I think it's going to be tough. But I'm going to take uh, Jackery Souza. I actually think that mm. he can work work his way in here. Um, fight in Brazil, I think, it's a big thing for him. Um, how many more shots is he going to get a UFC title? This is probably his only shot where he can maybe do it two or five, and it's going to be tough. Oh, it's hard to get a shot. I, I think he's yeah. a couple of guys in the line. You've got Corey Anderson, you've got yeah. Reyes as well. So it's a potential waiting list for him. Yeah, but we've seen John Jones come out and say, look, he's not really these Corey Andersons and Dominic Reyes. He, he doesn't really, he doesn't he, get him excited. He doesn't but, get a choice who he gets to fight. I know, they, they I know. put name down, he fights him. But if you have Jackery coming in here, I think he's going to fight Reyes regardless next. Yeah. But if Jackery comes in here, Say like if he stopped Lachovic here, stopped another top guy, they're going to give him that shot against John Jones. That's a fight that you could market for um, two kind of beasts of the sport, pretty much. Um, probably this is another one of these picks where it might end up. I don't know how many people are going to be picking Jackery. I've just got a feeling he's going to get him down, and eventually he's going to catch him with a submission. So I'll go Jackery Souza. Maybe a third round, fourth round submission there. Nice, okay, cool. Mm. I'm actually going to go the other way. I'm going to Yan. Yeah. going to go to Yan the powerhouse. Mm. Um, again, it's not went well for the guys going up a weight class. I thought oh. Jack Array did get hurt in the Weidman fight was the thing. He got lit up. Speed was the thing with the Hermanson fight. I thought the speed was a factor. Hermanson, he's got a good quick snap jab. He's good. He's got, he's, he is fast. Blakovich is not the same speed as Hermanson. Um, but I do think that he's going to be a Hermanson. Uh, is is good with the grappling aspect, but I think Blakovic is hard to get. He is hard to get down. He is. Um, it's not easy work, and I think that Jacare will try to get the t- fight down. That's the best way he's going to win. I thought on the feet he's not too bad at the boxing. He's done a bit. He's coming on. He's coming on a little bit more of the the boxing, the head movement, bit co- bit confidence in the Weidman fight. But Weidman's boxing isn't 
top level. Uh, so it was readable, his strikes. But I think Blakovic, in the clinch game, you saw it with the Rockhold thing. He'll start low, he'll, fro he'll just unload. If you clinch with him, he'll, he'll unload with like short shot, shops, uh, shots. Sorry. Uh, I think he's got his good kicks as well. I think Blakovic can whip in those body kicks, especially to Jacare, to really kind of slow that engine down. Five rounds is a long time. The pair of them are going to start getting sweaty as well in Brazil. Quick. So for takedowns, if someone's dripping with sweat, it's not that easy when they're dripping with sweat. So that's another factor to take into it. Jacare will find it a bit harder to get the takedowns in because it'll be a lot easier for Blakovic to slip it and slide his arms in for the underhooks, for example, because they'll be so sweaty. Um, after the first round, that's pretty much it. Then they're just going to be dripping with sweat. So Van Blakovic, keep the fight on the keep the fight on the outside. Use your use your, use your straights. Use your leg kicks as well and body kicks and stop really hit the tank of uh, Sosa and just use that kind of size advantage and pick away for five rounds. And I think he can get a decision win, if not a stoppage later on. But I'm going with Blakovic. I think he's on a run. Especially, he, he didn't have a great time because he went away from his camp, original camp in Poland, came back to them. And he has, he, he's come on tenfold and he's back to the guy that was an absolute savage outside of the UFC who signed up. And, and I still believe in it now. I still think he's on a great run. He's on a great ride. And I think it's another one for him. I think it's a great one. He gets, takes out Luke Rockhold and then he takes out Jacare. Blakovic has got a crack. I think it might see Blakovic and Corey Anderson maybe if, he doesn't if Corey doesn't you know that probably be the next one they'll do that one as a the the, the fight the, who fights the winner of Reyes and uh, John Jones maybe has that fight happened before I think it has I, I mm -hmm. think I, I think, think Blackwich oh, won yeah yeah um, actually Blackwich. let me see that that's, that's intriguing so I've got a funny feeling that Corey Anderson actually took him down in that fight yeah, Corey think. Anderson won the decision uh, sorry yeah it's a long time ago yeah, so I think you could do the rematch easily. I think you could easily do the rematch with them too. I think the two of them will fight the winner of Reyes and John Jones, which will be John Jones, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so you're going to be Jan, I'm going to be Jacare mm -hmm. in that one there. So that's our picks for UFC Sao Paulo at the road. We're going to quickly go through the betting side. Um, if you have any bets or if you have any kind of picks out there you want us to know about and talk about, get them in the drop down box and they we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Like I say, my one bet, I've got I've got a parlay. I've got Charles Oliveira. I've got Tracy Cortez um, in a parlay. I think it's plus 110 I got them at. Nice. Uh, that's, that's when Charles Oliveira was minus 275 and mm. uh, Cortez was minus 187. Actually, money's coming in in Melo in this spot here. So her, her line's a little bit lower, but I wanted to get into that Charles Oliveira because yeah. I knew his line was going to go up. And he's now minus 360. So I, I got a good I think line. I still go up, mate. Yeah, I, oh, it will. I think absolutely. I think he'll go I over think my. He's like four. 500 probably by the come fight week. Fight yeah, so Charlie Gordon, like plus 300s. Not out of the realm of possibility in case he catches mm. him, but I just I don't see it happening. Um, underdog bets for me, Jackery actually kind of. I plus 175. Okay. Actually, it's kind I of. Think it's a bit, I think it's a bit big. I would have done like a 125, yeah. possibly be a yeah. bit more respectable. I would rather be on the, the Jackery side betting wise than the minus 210 that's beside Jan's name. Um. What's Ronaldo? Yeah, Trinaldo's minus one fifteen, Bobby Green minus one oh five, so pick him, pick him okay, cool. more or less, cool. yeah. Yeah. Um What about um Douglas Andra Andre Andra, how do you pronounce it? Yeah, he's minus two forty. So Jeez. he's a pretty sizable favourite against Brow here. And that 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 I want no part of that fight mm -hmm. um at all. I I couldn't bet Andraj at that number, even though Brow is so bad. But if I had to throw some change it would be on Brow. Uh, but I don't think I can do that. And what about Hamas? What's he at? Uh, minus two fifty-five. Ah, drats. So he needs a, like a parlay piece. piece yeah. He could be a parlay piece if you want it. That was the the person I initially was going to put mm. with Cortez, maybe. Uh, uh, Cortez mm. initially because I didn't think I was going to get that good a line. I didn't think I was mm. definitely going to get minus two seventy-five and Oliveira. So I was going to put Ramos and Cortez together, but thought against it. Uh, Randy Brown minus one hundred five. Wally always minus fifty, uh, minus one fifteen. So I'll pick him That's again. High, yeah. What's yeah, uh, Kraus? He's minus two ten. Mariah's plus one seventy five. So he's a sizable. Oh, yeah, it's a lot. Is, yeah. So there's some good fight. Munoz and Arroyos. I pick him. You've got Perez and Tarman, which Perez is minus one thirty, plus one ten on Tarman. So that's a 
closest one, but there is a lot of minus 240s, minus 260. Mm. Shogun's minus 260 over uh, the Bear Jew. Um, what about Machado and, and uh, Lipsky, all those again? Machado, minus 160, uh, Ariane and Lipsky, plus 140. I, th- I can see money coming in Lipsky a little bit as the mm. week goes on, probably. Um, but like I said, I think it's just a fight to sit back and watch with that one yeah. and see how it goes. But Definitely yeah, watch that one. You've got some pickums, and then you've got some pretty hefty favourites mm. in there. So uh, yeah, that's kind of those two. I don't know where I'm going to go. Up. Maybe a, a bet on Jackery. We'll see how he looks through fight week and see if he looks completely undersized because Jan's a big dude. Like so. Yeah, when they when they do uh, the face off on was it yeah. Wednesday or Thursday or something like that, or yeah. the Wednesday? Uh-huh. Uh huh. <laughs> what is actually Shogun fight doesn't go to decision minus three or five. Hua wins inside distance minus one thirty. Mm, not bad. Hua wins by decision plus three eighty five. No, nah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be betting any of those. But uh, yeah, so um, that's our picks for UFC Sao Paulo. It's uh, talking a little about the betting at the end there. Like I said, if you've got any of your picks, bets, whatever it may be, get them down in there and let us know and get chatting and get to. Uh, speaking with other people on there and see what they're um, saying regarding this card. Um, That's us, and that's going to be us for a few weeks. Hallelujah. A little bit of a break before we've got a run into, I think we've got Washington on December 7th. Mm -hmm. We've got UFC 245, which is a big, big card. And then we've got South Korea, which is actually a really, really, really good card. That's tasty turned into as well, yeah, surprising that card. Korean yeah. Zombie against uh, T-City. T-City. Right. And then, as far as it looks, it looks like we've got a month off. Close um, enough, yeah. Pretty much the base, yeah, 21st to the 18th. Yeah, yeah, so I think we've got a month uh, off mm. to the 18th. But they just announced that they're going, I think it's North Carolina on the 25th of yeah. January. So depending on if this McGregor card's going to get put in the, the 18th of January, but we're going to have a, a nice break over Christmas and New Year which is definitely needed and then we're probably going to have like a three month stretch of fight cards every, <laughs> every, every yeah. week again until or something. so uh, yeah until then guys please like comment subscribe tell a friend uh, help us grow the channel and until um, the middle of December early December mm. we'll see you then all the best take care and enjoy the card this weekend <laughs>